The following program, Live and Learn, is made possible by Aging Partners. Find out more on their website at agingpartners at lincoln.ne.gov. Hi, I'm Lita Powell Drake. If you love reading books but you have a visual impairment, please stay tuned because we're going to be talking about talking book and braille service. Hi, my name is Tom White and today we'll be discussing scams and cons and how to protect yourself against them with Joanne Farrell from Aging Partners. I'm Harlan Johnson and I'm going to be talking with members of the Aging Partners staff today about important things like homestead exemption and filing your taxes. A cancer diagnosis can be devastating, but my guest, Dr. Tracy Bender, will offer some hope for post-treatment care. This and more on today's Live and Learn. Hi, I'm Lita Powell Drake, and one of the greatest pleasures is to read a good book. But as we age and our eyesight begins to diminish, it gets harder and harder and harder. And if you're in a position where you can't read at all, well, we're very fortunate to have some wonderful services available for you in Lincoln. And it's Talking Book and Braille Service. And we have with us today the Director of Talking Book and Braille Service, David Ortley. Welcome to Live Thank and you, Learn. Thank you, Lita. Thank and, you. And, 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 and our good friend, Scott Schultz, who is the Audio Production Director. They're the two who make it happen when, when you're really going to get a, a, a proper book. Now, this is a free service. And I'd like to find out who qualifies of our viewers who are watching. Who can use this service? Well, Lita, any Nebraskan qualifies if they struggle to see regular print or hold a book or turn its pages because of visual or physical disability. So it could be glaucoma, could be arthritis, could be a tremor, could be macular degeneration. Um, any kind of visual impairment would qualify you. Um, physical disability would qualify you. Um, and also people who experience dyslexia. Oh. So those three broad categories. Now, how long has the service been around right here in Lincoln? We've had it in Lincoln since 1952. <laughs> I'm, I'm astounded that that's quite, that's quite some time ago. And of course, the technology has changed We've dramatically. We've upgraded technology, yeah. So it's getting easier and easier to be able to read. Uh, now, um, people use your services, and one, one of the uh, uh, people in the audience from Lincoln uses your service, Zoya. Zoya. Tell us a little yes. bit about Zoya. And what a wonderful, what a wonderful name. Yeah, Zoya. she's a wonderful person. Yeah, she's been using her service for a number of years now, and uh, she is an av avid reader, and um, and uh, she speaks highly of it. We're pleased to um, to have her as, as someone who who would benefit from the service and and who who does use it. So she sits there, just pushes the button, and listens to the story that she has already selected. Right. That's correct. Now, of course. Um, we were able, fortunately, to take a tour of the place, which is just located right downtown in the atrium, the Talking Book and Braille Service, to give you an idea of what to expect when you come in. So let's take a look at that now. Okay, uh, this is the main entrance to the Nebraska Library Commission, and we are part of that program, part of the Nebraska Library Commission. The doors are automatic, which are very practical and very helpful. As you come into the main entry, uh, the, the sweeping counter on the left is for talking books, and there's one of our reader advisor, and just across the way is information services, and that's part of the library commission. But they do help us, also they help public libraries and other um, uh, some state employees and so on. We're in the, uh, one of the large buildings in downtown Lincoln. And we want to make certain that everybody realizes all this is free to you. It's all free. Those and are mobiles hanging children, from the ceiling. Children, blind children. Those are, those are from the summer reading program. They're high, they are above our Braille books. This is a Braille book that is both in print and in Braille. I'm showing you how, how you read Braille. Now, I sight read Braille slowly, but to show that when you read Braille as a blind person, you learn to use your index finger and just brush it lightly because it's the delicate touch that tells you the information that you want. We've got I about 2,800. I put my, I ran my fingers over those bumps yes. and, and I found it very difficult. Yes, there's a learning curve mm -hmm. and people go into Braille classes to learn how to do it. Here's our Braille embosser. 
Uh, most Braille is produced through computers these days, so the Braille feeds into the bottom up through the, the mechanism there, and we compose letters and, and memorandums and, and um, our newsletter, and then we can bring it to the Braille room and produce it in Braille. Now, you need volunteers, don't you, to do the actual narration? That's right. Yeah, here we're looking at the recording studios. Uh, these are actually brand new studios that we just installed in the last month now. And volunteers come in, usually in shifts from 90 minutes to two hours. And they have, some have book projects that they're working on. Others help us with a number of magazines that we record each month. Um, altogether, we record 23 different kinds of periodicals, magazines, and newsletters and those sorts of things right now. And then we have a staff person who sits on the other side and does the actual recording and follows along with the copy of the text and we try to make sure everything's word perfect. And, and if it's not word perfect, what do you do? We'll stop and make them do it again. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> many, many times. It ends up word perfect. <laughs> yes, it does. Whoa, look at the stacks. Yes, wow. this, um, this is near the recording studios in the circulation area. and. Um, Every morning we go through with mail cards. Most of the books go back and forth through the mail. And again, the mail is free as well. And um, we pull the mail cards and match them to the books. And then we check those out and they go into a bunch of mail bags where they get delivered to the Postal Service who then takes them all over the state. How many of these cartridges would you, do you have on file? Oh, we've got about 18,000 oh, titles. And it grows about two to 3,000 per year. Oh. So they just go in the mail, and this is free, coming to your house? That's right. That's right. It's tax-supported, but there's no additional cost. Yeah, when you're done with the book, you just turn the mail card over and put it back in the mail, and it comes back to us. Well, and this is available to anybody in Nebraska or just a certain area? Statewide. Statewide. Oh, excellent. Docking book and Braille service located right downtown, uh, 12th and N Street in the atrium. Stop by some time and just take a look. It, it's really astounding. And of course, we're talking about Braille. And I happen to think, Braille, why is it called Braille? Aha, uh -huh. the guy who knows, David, who was Louis Braille? Louis Braille was a remarkable young man. When he was three years old, he was playing in his father's leather shop and he injured his eye with a sharp tool called an owl and it got infected. His parents tried to save his sight. It didn't work, and he eventually lost sight in both eyes. And he was in regular school. We would call regular school. He was born in 1809 yes. outside of Paris, but for the first 10 years. And then he went to the National Institute for Blind Youth in Paris. It was a national school for the blind in Paris. He was 12 years old. And one of Napoleon's generals had an idea. He had experimented with something called night riding, which was a way to communicate to other troops in the dark, in quiet, without lighting a candle. It was a, something you would raise on a piece of paper to give him some instructions. Mm -hmm. so when the war was over, he offered this as an idea, and Louis Braille took with it and ran with it. And he spent three years, and when he was 15 years old, he produced the Braille Code as we have it today, pretty much. It's been revised and updated several times over. Um, and Lewis, uh, he stayed on to teach uh, mathematics and history at the school. He became an accomplished organist and played all around uh, France, the organ. And that's important because in addition to the Braille for text, he also developed Braille for music notation. This is incredible. We're talking eight, like 1840, and a 1840, blind that's right. young man is able to do this. And the amazing thing to me is when the Napoleon army is out there, then they put those bumps, say they have to tell them at night, you know, they're going to have some charge to have to make that's at right. night. And on the fence posts that would be out there in a field, there are the bumps. What we'll call the Braille bumps yes, now. Yes, it was refined. Saying, yes. go left or go right or in the, at night. So that That's right. But he had to make the system a ca a more useful to a blind person. So a single yes. touch conveys information. With mm -hmm. Braille, you touch a cell, it, it, the entire word, it, it, it's contracted Braille. It can, it, it's, it's a wonderful system. Well, Louis Braille, aren't we, aren't we thrilled? That he a lot of blind people, read, yeah, um, they, they're fully literate absolutely. now. They read and write with Braille. That's amazing. 
Uh, let's take a look at the, if you're interested or need this facility. Let's take a look at the playback machine and how this works. You will get this for free, right? It's on free loan. Free loan. Okay. It's free loan. I'm going to turn it on. All right. By the way, the letters are color contrast because many people who get talking books have some useful sight. Mm -hmm. They just can't see regular print. But also, they're tactile. You, you can feel the shapes. Here's, here's a power button. Player on. Press any button to learn about its function. Battery charge remaining. Greater than 29 hours. And every key you touch will vocalize. Volume down. To decrease the volume by one step, press the volume down button. There are 15 volume steps. Wow. Fast forward. Press this fast forward button <laughs> once to move forward five seconds in the book. Press and hold this fast power. Battery charge remaining. Greater than 29 hours. Back player off. Oh, that is amazing. Now you just open it up and insert the book, right? Yes, that has we brought a book to show well, that. Or the magazine or whatever or it is that you want. And this is a mailing container. It comes through the mail. It's prepaid postage. Press any button to learn about its function. Battery charge remaining. Greater than. And this is the book itself. It's just a cartridge. And it has a large hole because of uh, it, it, it for ease and use. It goes right inside. The Mockingbird. That's it. Oh, how That's simple. It. Make it simple. What kind of books do you have, David? Player off. We have the same kind of books you find in most bookstores at public libraries. Westerns, mysteries, romances. Mm -hmm. um, one of the pleasant surprises when I became director was to find out that when a person loves Westerns and they go blind, they still love Westerns. <laughs> Nothing changed. Yeah. It's yeah. the same person. <laughs> We have biographies. It, it, we have the whole whole scope. Okay. How long can people? Uh, how how long can can they keep them once they get it in the mail? About six weeks. Ah. Oh. And then they get a friendly letter to remind you there's <laughs> an overdue. It's, it's not too harsh, but a reminder. You know? Okay. And so they can keep them for about six weeks. Do you need any volunteer narrators? Uh, it depends on the day of the week, but Fridays tend to be tougher because it's the beginning of a weekend, and. Um, we're also looking at some volunteer reviewers, which is uh, something we would train you to do, but it would be um, a good use for volunteers as well. Too. It's for qual quality, uh, as quality check of the, our audio products. And how long does it take, if you're going to be a narrator, how long would it take you to do that? Um, usually we have people come in for 90 minutes to two hour sessions, kind of depending on what fits in the calendar. Um, some come in twice a week. Most, I think, come in once a week at this point. So you get to read a good book at the same time, and you're really helping a lot of people. Now, if people are interested in volunteering as a narrator, do you have the number that they can call? Yes, 800-742-7691. All right. Uh, and if you'd like to sign up to receive this service, if this may be one of the first times you've learned about this, uh, we have an address. On, on the we have a play on the web, talking book and braille service, and so we have a web. Or you can call that same number. That same number. Eight hundred seven four two seven six nine one. Now there is an application that you have to fill out because not just anybody can come in to use the services. No, that's you right. have to have a visual impairment that the doctor says. Is that correct? Or physical impairment. Visual or physical. Oh, oh, oh physical. Oh, okay. Yes, mm -hmm. and they have an application form. The, the medical person would sign this part of it. Could be a nurse, a medical doctor, your eye doctor, could be a counselor, or, uh, uh, could be a social worker, but someone who's in a position to evaluate your condition would, would sign the bottom part and just mail it to okay, us. Okay, so you get this what? You go into the atrium and, and, and pick this yes. up or you can download we it can, on the web. We can download it, we can mail it to you and you would complete it and send it back to so us. So just, you could call the office and ask That's for right. this. Excellent. Many do. Excellent, so put that in the mail. Make sure, you know, your doctor has to sign it. Yeah. Now, you don't, you have to go to your regular doctor, you have to go to an ophthalmologist, 
Eat either way. Eat either way. <laughs> okay. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about this, I hope you received the magazine, the Living Well magazine. This is the issue because there's a detailed information in here. So if you miss some of the stuff uh, that we were uh, mentioning today with regards to the telephone numbers and so forth, you can find it right in here. Thanks to David Ortley and Scott Schultz. You provide a marvelous service to our community. Thank and you, you are to Lydia. be congratulated. And we thank you so very much from talking book and braille service. Right? And remember, it's never too late to learn to read. Can you sing, dance, do magic, or have another talent? Come show it off at Lincoln Seniors Got Talent. Aging Partners is hosting a talent show featuring local seniors in honor of Older Americans Month. For more information, contact Aging Partners at 402-441-6156 or email zolson at lincoln.ne.gov. Hello, I'm Tom White, and my guest today is Joanne Farrell from Aging Partners. Uh, Joanne is a social worker and serves as liaison between the Lincoln Police Department and Aging Partners. And hi, Joanne, how are you? I'm good, thank you for having me. That's this good. is a fabulous topic. Yes, I agree. So, uh, yeah, our, our topic today is scams. And first of all, let me ask you this. How many people have lost their entire life savings to con artists and various types of scams? A lot of people have, and how does this happen? Well, it happens because there's as many kinds of scams as we, we hear about new ones every day. So the people that, that are the con artists or the scammers are very, very brilliant at what they're doing. Mm. Not only are they brilliant, they're persuasive. Mm. This is really where they begin to form an emotional relationship, very personal relationship with the individual. And this can happen on the phone. It can happen uh, on the computer. You know, it can happen on the mail. And once a person engages in this, what happens is they become a target. They're on a list. And that they become where they get more and more mail. Then phone calls become more and more. They kind of groom the person mm -hmm. to kind of be their friend or their associate or their, just, you know, whatever problem that, that the person might have, they'll, they'll help them with it or whatever. And then they start asking for the money. Mm -hmm. And then that's when the issues begin. So what would some of the red flags be for, or the warning signs that people can look for to avoid getting scammed like this? Well, there, there's a, a number of different things. One of the things we look at is the people that wire money, there's transaction forms or Western Union money grams, and you'll see them in the house. You'll see them on the table or on the counter in the kitchen. Um, you'll see financial information out where they're looking at what they have so that they can figure out how much more can they send or f because once they get wiring, they'll wire larger sums of money. They'll start with very small amounts and it'll go into a higher amount. And this is why a lot of people can lose you know, their homes because they're, they're, the, the con artists are looking for people that are lonely, um, have emotional problems or might be widowed. Uh, and what, what they're trying to do is, you know, they're trying to find people that are very independent as well. So the, a lot of the people that we have are, um, let's say, well-dressed, have a job, might volunteer. Um, you know, they're, 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 they drive a car. They, they're, they're very, they have money and means. These are the types of folks that they go after. So, like, what would be, can you give me a specific example of a scam um, perhaps a, either a phone scam or this, or by email. Uh, An email over the internet. Mm -hmm. um, that's a huge problem with the internet because people can zero in on your home. They can be out of the country. Mm -hmm. um, you don't know where they're at, and and then the person begins to and 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 we've had a couple like this recently, where uh, the gentleman wanted to meet a lady have a relationship mm -hmm. over the internet and what happened was they're 
several times a day on the internet and they're talking and talking because they don't know who's on the other side. They could actually be talking to or, you know, emailing a, guy. a man. Yeah. So you, you don't look them in the eye anymore. Um, you don't see them, but they're telling you what you want to hear. They, they find out what the, what the need is and mm -hmm. then they kind of groom you till they get to the point where they're sending money. Um, it might be because the person's overseas. A lot of times they'll tell them they're in another country and, oh, you know, they need money to carry on a business issue and they didn't know they were going to need it, so they start asking for a sum of money. Mm -hmm. And the person wires it. Right. And then it just continues like this until then they start saying, well, maybe we'll come and see you, but I'm going to need money to get there. So that's the kind of thing that goes on. Is there a way that we can protect ourselves before any of this happens? Are there things we can do? You know, it's, it's, it's very difficult because, you know, a lot of people will say the old, if it sounds too good to be true, it's probably not true. Mm -hmm. uh, people get impulsive when they get phone calls that there's like the grandparent scheme, you mm -hmm. know, where they, they're worried about their grandson and they, they don't take time to get the facts. And, and we have people that, um, well, you know, will come off the street and say you need a new gutter or a new roof. And, oh, well, okay, you'll do it for this. Well, then, you know, they hire them. They don't get the facts. The, the, the problem is, is that it's hard for people to, they have the impulsive nature, the fear they put in them. Mm. And a lot of people will get fear, they'll get phone calls. We've had phone calls where they're, they'll, they'll threaten the individual and the individual will become very, very afraid and call the police. Mm. And, you know, they'll, we'll go in there and they'll have just stacks and stacks of mail. They were doing the mail, sending uh -huh. out money in the mail. And then they'll start calling them on the phone. So those are, you know, don't check everything out. Don't be impulsive. Don't, if you're afraid, call the police. Okay. Call somebody to help you. A lot of the people that we're dealing with do have, they, even though they're well-dressed, they might have a job, they look like they're functioning they have cognitive issues. And those are hard for us to see or hard for a family member to know. So what happens is, how do we protect those kinds of folks? Mm -hmm. That's the issue. Um, and, 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 and remember, don't just believe what you're seeing over the phone or the internet or whatever, the mail. It used to be when we could look into people's eyes when they were robbing a bank, we knew we were a victim. We know we're a victim. Mm -hmm. These people, they don't look in their eyes and they don't care about their emotional needs mm -hmm. or their trauma that they're gonna suffer or the loss of their money, they're evil. This money, for most part, if you think of all the money in this country that's being mailed out, wired out, whatever, um, what happens is the money goes to what? what does, where does this money go? And I, I had an FBI agent tell me that the money goes for terrorists, it's used against us. It's used to buy bullets to kill our, our guys overseas. People don't think of all this. You know, they just don't understand the breadth and depth of it. So there must be, so to protect ourselves or to, when this happens, you've given some examples of what to do when this happens. Is there anything else we can do or? I think if anybody feels that their loved one or their neighbor or their friend, uh, there's things that they're worried about that they need to call, either call um, Lincoln Police Department, call uh, our office, they can call Adult Protective Services, um, you know, so look into it, try to check what, you know, what you feel there's something wrong. The, the, the way we can protect people when we go out, we look at the extent of the victimization and we assess with the police and I go out, we'll assess the situation and how we're gonna protect them. How can we protect them? And each situation's different depending upon the individual and the amount that's um, involved in it. And then I offer resources and that's one thing a lot of people like a social worker going out with a, uh, an investigator because they feel like they might know aging partners or they get the magazine or, you know, so there's, there's a connection there. So instead of just an officer coming out, here is a social worker. And so we're there to provide emotional support and continue to help on after the police are done. So th this is a, and this is a big problem. This is- It's a, a huge of, problem. Like roughly, do we know how much money, I, this wasn't a question that I had 
that I that we had discussed. But do we know roughly how much a year or? You know, I d I don't know how we could sure really figure lot. that out. I think if you if you look at, and I think we've talked about this. You put you put five dollars in an envelope of mail to a lottery. Mm -hmm. I put it in. The people in in, in Lincoln. There's ten thousand oh, dollars going right, out. You look on Omaha, you look at Dallas, you look at Los Angeles, you look at the whole country, you think of how much money is being mailed out, is uh, being uh, wired out. And the other thing that this will go to, it'll go to a higher level. We can lock down the money sometimes with the victim and they'll use them to commit more crimes. They will use them, they will send their mail, other people's mail to them, they will get them to give them the credit card mm -hmm. information and shred the mail. There's a whole different level of involving this person. So it's so important that we can get in there and stop this before it goes to that level. So there's federal crimes. I mean, they're using that victim to, to do uh, work with them to, to commit more crimes. So really what, what it seems people can do before the fact is to educate themselves, learn as much as they can about the different types of scams that there are out there. Uh, and, and don't be impulsive and oh, don't right. be afraid. You know, right. make your choices, inform choices, get people to help you, get your family. And I know sometimes it's very difficult for them to admit that they might do it. And sometimes we talk to families and say, this is going on, and they won't believe us. Mm -hmm. And then they come back later and say, we wish we had paid attention to you because now mom uh, wired off a half a million dollars. Mm. So just, you need to pay attention? And you, to everybody needs to pay attention to everything that they're doing and what they're getting in the mail and who they're interacting on the phone or the internet. Those phone calls will come sometimes 50 a day. So Joanne, tell me more about the mail scams, about using the U.S. mail. What do they do there? Well, it, it's always an, uh, an interesting experience with some of these situations because uh, one of the things that I learned was that when you've been a victim, and we've been able to lock down your money. So you can't, you know, either this might be a conservatorship mm -hmm. where legally somebody's protecting your money. Get, mm -hmm. Again, it depends on the, how much, what the victimization was. In some cases, it's so bad that you have to, the family has to maybe step in and be a conservator. Mm -hmm. And they can control the money. And then we don't get any money. And they don't get any mail. Because the mail, again, is a way that people get them the victim to engage with them and then now they don't have any of their own money to send out so they use them as I don't know what you would call them like a mule to, c to continue to commit the crimes that that the, the con artist the scammer is doing so I take the older adult and they uh, we had one where she was receiving 13 people's mail and what happened is I just happened to stop in one night to check on him because something told me in my gut that I needed to stop and I stopped at night and checked on him and the, the husband said, she's getting all this mail. And I said, what do you mean mail? You don't get your mail. No, she's getting all this mail. Well, and then he showed me the mail. It's people all over the country's mail. And when you look at it, it's social security documents, tax documents, credit cards. And what they would do is have her go out to the mail every day come in, they knew what time she would be sitting there at 2 o'clock, and they would call her. She would open up the mail and give them the credit card information so they oh. could use that to further their scams, and then also tell her to cut up the credit card and to sh shred the mail. So when I saw this, I was so shocked, you know, so I called um, uh, the investigator I work with at, at LPD and said, whoa, 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 you know, I've never seen this. She said, oh, yeah, so we called the postal we call him Postal Paul up in Omaha, and he came down the next morning, and we sat down with the with the couple, and yes, you know, yes, I'm getting the mail. She admitted the whole thing at that point, and then we we took the mail to to the Postal Paul, and he took it back up to Omaha and worked. You know, they worked further on the investigation that way. But I said to him, what else could they do? And he said, they can get him involved in receiving packages. So there's different levels of taking the victim. When the victim, well, and this, this lady had dementia, she loved working with them. I mean, she was so connected to these people and, and it gave her some sort of satisfaction. She didn't really understand, you know, this is a federal crime, you can't do right. this. But that's the cognitive issue sometimes that we have to deal with. Yeah. 
And, and, and to look at this woman, she played bridge. She was, I mean, she was very, uh, I mean, you know, really bright, interesting to talk to. It was living in home. Again, wealth, had money, access to money. And one of the things we had also discussed, because we, we have a little bit of time here, but, uh, well, was we were talking about not being overly uh, frightened by all these situations because when there were le are legitimate, if someone has a legitimate business or... Well, you know, one of the things when I said get your facts, mm, you know, if somebody's got a business or you need something done on your home or that, you can go to the Better Business Bureau. Sure. You know, you can ask for references. But these unsolicited, it's these unsolicited calls mm -hmm. and emails. And right. And, and once they start on those phone calls, that's, it becomes almost unbearable to live in the house because they just continue. And people don't understand. They're not talking to one person. This is a person sitting in a call center with, in Jamaica with headsets on and they're pressing buttons going from you to someone else and if you hang up on them or whatever they just press a button and they're talking to someone else so in a way imagine in your head a call center and they're they're con artists they're they're thieves and they're using your money for what what are they taking your money and using it for it's against us you know that's how we're we're helping the uh the terrorists do more business, you know. I mean, it, people don't think of these kinds of things, but these are the things that are happening in these scams and with these con artists. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Joanne, for sharing all this information with us. Uh, my guest today has been Joanne Farrell, and uh, she's from Aging Partners, and we've been talking about scams. My name is Tom White, and please remember, it's never too late to live and learn. Can you sing, dance, do magic, or have another talent? Come show it off at Lincoln Seniors Got Talent. Aging Partners is hosting a talent show featuring local seniors in honor of Older Americans Month. For more information, contact Aging Partners at 402-441-6156 or email zolson at lincoln.ne.gov. Welcome to Live and Learn. I'm Harlan Johnson. And you know, this time of year, if you hadn't thought about it, it's time to be thinking about, you know, taxes. And so we're going to be talking about the homestead exemption and uh, helping people with their taxes. My guest is Houston Doan from Aging Partners. Also, two new staff people from Aging Partners, Leslie Aldag and Pat Williams. Hey, thank you folks for coming and being on the Live and Learn yes. Show. Thank you, Harlan. All thank right. You. Now, uh, Houston, uh, on homestead exemption, what's the financial criteria for uh, being eligible? Okay, well, actually there are several criteria. First of all, typically you must be over the age of 65, and the homestead tax exemption will give you either a partial or sometimes full tax relief on your home's property tax. Um, they use an adjusted gross income figure that's different than the adjusted gross income figure on your 1099 when you file your IRS taxes. They actually will add back in uh, your uh, untaxed portion of your Social Security and or your pensions. But realistically, we have couples that can have an adjusted gross income of up to $47,000 and still be eligible for partial homestead exemption. Okay. Well, now the next thing is, how long do I have to get this taken care of? What's well, the deadline? Okay. The deadline is basically January 1 through the end of June, June 30. So we still have plenty of time. All right. Now, is, is the criteria for a single person different than for, a, say, a two-person yeah, family household? Yeah, that, that's a good question. Yes. Um, single individuals are allowed to make up to uh, approximately $40,100. Uh, and again, remember, this is an adjusted 
uh, income figure that the is is actually calculated. Um, again, a married couple, they can have up to forty-seven thousand six hundred dollars and still get a partial um, tax relief. Now, is, does age play any role in this? You say you've yeah. got to start at 65. Yeah, you can either be 65 or uh, there is a disability um, exclusion on the age. For instance, now you, it must be a rather profound disability. Their, dis, their idea of disabled is completely different than, say, Social Security's criteria for disability. But there is a disability um, exclusion on age, which means you could be a homeowner and be 40 years old, and if you met the particular um, uh, criteria, then you would be eligible for tax relief. And of course, if you're a 100% disabled veteran, then of course you get um, automatic tax relief there. Okay, now the question of when aging partners comes in. Where can I go for getting help on filing for this? Well, I'm glad you brought that up. <laughs> uh, we help people go through this process every year. And it can be rather daunting, especially for people that are just for the first time filing for homestead tax exemption. Now, it's important if you're filing IRS taxes that you get that done first so we have the right numbers to plug into the homestead tax forms. If you don't file for, uh, if you don't file um, IRS taxes, then you know uh, we can do it anytime. Okay. Now the phone number for getting you is. Oh well, it's 402-441-7070. All right. Now and here, let's bring in these people who are going to be part of helping people, particularly with uh, income tax. Uh, Leslie, let's start out with you. Uh, aging Partners been doing this. You're comparatively new to Aging Partners, but uh, uh, tell us about what Aging Partners does uh, in, in helping you prepare. Well, my role at Aging Partners is uh, working with persons 16 and over with any of their financial and insurance questions, uh, concerns that they may have. There's a, a full range, and uh, just give us a call, and, and if we can't help you, then we can certainly refer you to someone that could. Okay. Now, uh, Pat, uh, who can qualify for this kind of assistance? Well, we focus on the aging population in our community, of course, which is a very important and growing segment of the Lincoln community. There's and a thing called baby boomers that's yes, kind of creeping up in there. And I'm one of them, right. <laughs> but uh, they're, we're coming through the pipeline, and it's swelling every, every day and every month. And Leslie and I are both part-time people, and we both have an extensive experience in the insurance industry to try to help people wade through all the red tape. Well, it, the question is, you know, this time of year, have you been kind of busy? Uh, it's getting there, yes. <laughs> <laughs> it is getting there. Uh, you know, having just started within the past month, mm -hmm. you know, we're, uh, we've been brought up to speed with everything that Aging Partners does uh, outside of our own you know, financial and insurance, and, and so we're really getting started now with phone calls and uh, talking with people and uh, meeting with them in the office with, with Houston, as well as going out and doing some presentations. So it, it's starting to pick up. Yeah. Now, Pat, you're comparatively new. Yes, Leslie okay. and I came on at the same, same time. time. Yeah. Okay, here you are. You just come on the job, and you're on TV already. Uh -huh. Holy cow, I like this situation. <laughs> now, now, what are the new wrinkles with the Affordable Care Act that's kind of causing some problems this year? Who wants to jump in we'll on this Houston one? Handle okay. Well, let Houston handle it. Thank you. Um, realistically, <laughs> this is the first year that individuals filing income tax and uh, typically under the age of 65 are going to have to say either they did have credible health insurance coverage or if not they actually will get a penalty 
and it is very confusing. Additionally, even if you did have credible health insurance, you may be eligible, depending on your income, for subsidies toward the premiums of that health insurance. So it really has really um, thrown a lot of people for a loop because it is a very complicated program. And this is the first year that people are really beginning to go, oh gee, Maybe I should have gotten health insurance <laughs> because I'm right. going to have to what pay are, a penalty. What, what's the paperwork that uh, someone needs to bring to your office in order to get this thing going and get it started? Well, um, okay, if we're talking income tax, we actually yeah. have partnered with AARP, and they have a wonderful group of people that come to our downtown senior center. And, of course, you would need to bring the typical information, W-2s if you're still working, uh, statements on interest, statements on other income, for instance a pension, or your Social Security. Um, additionally, you will have to have some proof of insurance this time around. Now, the proof really is not um, draconian you just say well yes I did have insurance and they can list the name of the company as I recall we don't even need a policy number just the name of the company right now but you know it's going to get more and more complicated and they probably will require more and more documentation as this law further becomes ingrained in the tax code okay so the magic word is if I know the insurance company that I have as a carrier, then that's all the information you need. That's probably all you're going to need okay. for the initial filing. All yes. right. So uh, is the, uh, the tax timing now, are we, are we getting busy? I know the gals are just new at this, but uh, is it beginning to stack up for you and everybody? It is. It, it really... Um, you know, as I say, we partnered with AARP. I believe right now they have no appointments available until sometime later in March. So that's really stacking up as far as when you can get in and, and get this help. So if we have people that are interested in getting help with their income tax, pick up the phone. Okay, Call. so that yeah, that old phone number yeah. is very important. It and, really and is. Get, uh, to get an appointment made. Yeah. Okay, yeah. all right. Well, now, uh, then once once they have got an appointment made, and they would do this through basically the downtown mm -hmm. uh, aging partners office there, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, uh, then uh, that's where they would go for uh, filing this. For help with filing with their federal income tax, yes. Okay. And then... If they, at that same time, would need help with their homestead exemption, we'd be there to offer that help. Okay. Or they could make a, an appointment later <coughs> because, as I pointed out, we have all the way till June, June. 30 to get the homestead tax <coughs> exemption paperwork in. And like you said, you've got to have the uh, federal income tax filled right. out before you can do the homestead right. exemption. If, so, if you okay. file. You know, and right. we have a lot of older adults that don't need to file. And then all they need is just a statement of their earnings uh, if they don't file. And we can take those people anytime. Okay. Yeah. Any last minute words here for people? Well, what? what's the cutoff, Houston, for not having to file if uh, someone is, doesn't actually have to file an income tax? Um, again, June 30. Oh, okay. Okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, hey, a lot of information here today. Yeah. And it's been real good. Good meeting you, ladies. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Houston, always glad to see you. A pleasure. As always. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. All right. And Live and Learn will be back. And remember, it's never too late to live and to learn. What does Medicare cover? How can I afford to keep living in my home? When I need help with house and yard work, who can I turn to? Why am I so tired? Am I eating right? Should I exercise? Where can I go for answers to my questions about aging? Aging Partners is the place to call when you have questions on aging. Our experts are here to help you with unbiased answers for you or your loved ones. 
aging partners were only a phone call away. Hi, I'm Chris Beckenbach. For those who've faced a cancer diagnosis, that can leave an awful lot of questions when you face the trauma and the uncertainty of what might happen next. I'm sure for most there's not really much thought given to post-treatment therapy, but my guest today can help you start with those, uh, that post-treatment hope and uh, rehabilitation even before you, you face surgery. My guest is Tracy Bender. Welcome, Tracy. Thank you, Chris. Tracy, tell us a little bit about your background and experience. Well, I'm an occupational therapist. I received my doctorate in occupational therapy at Creighton University. I've been practicing for about nine years, and I also am now specialized in cancer rehabilitation and lymphedema treatment. All right, well, let's start with what exactly is lymphedema? Lymphedema is a protein-rich swelling that can affect pretty much anybody. There are two causes of that. A primary um, lymphedema would be caused by something being wrong with the lymphatic system at birth. And a secondary lymphedema would be caused by some type of an insult, injury, or disease process to the body, such as cancer. So is it the cancer that causes lymphedema, or is it the, the treatment and reparative processes that... It, it can be both. There can be blockages from an actual tumor, and, it, and most likely it would be caused by your cancer treatment. Okay. And what might that look like on, on somebody? How would they... What would lymphedema appear as? Abnormal swelling. In a typical onset, you would see that very slowly progressing, and it would be in the distal part of a limb, but you can have lymphedema anywhere on your body. Okay. Um, do you see it any more frequently, let's say, in breast cancer survivors, or...? Yes. Um, we do see it... Breast cancer survivors are at a higher risk of developing lymphedema because of the components to treatment. Okay. Well, some are, what are some of the ways that you help uh, patients and those recovering from cancer to, to take care of themselves? Well, it's really important first and foremost to learn about lymphedema and the risks that you face, whether you have it or not. So it's, it's individualized. We need to take a look at your diagnosis specifically and the treatment that you plan to have or the treatment that you have had and then take it from there so that we can identify your risk factors and anything along the lines of your personal abilities or disabilities um, that play into that. So before you even go down the path of treatment, it might be important to meet with, with you. Absolutely, yes. We do um, pre-cancer pre treatment or surgical intervention uh, sessions so that we can educate our patients on li what lymphedema is, the risk of lymphedema, um, and then also things that they can do to be preventative. There are a lot more things that we know about now that can help prevent that condition from arising, but then also identify different types of things that can come along with cancer rehab that people don't have to live with. Like what are some of those things, Tracy? Well, there are definitely a lot of different effects of chemo, and there are a lot of effects of radiation. There are effects from surgical interventions, whether it be scar tissue or um, mobility limitations or chronic pain. Okay. I know uh, you talk about decongestive therapy. Tell me a little mm -hmm. bit about that. Complete decongestive therapy is how we treat lymphedema, and there are a few components to that. Uh, the first one being skin care. We need to make sure that a person does not develop um, infection. And so when we have fluid sitting in our tissue that's not supposed to be there, we're at a greater risk of infection. So we start with that. We do a special massage that's called manual lymph drainage. That helps to circulate the lymph um, and stimulate the components of the lymphatic system to work more efficiently and also work with other parts of the body that may not have been damaged or affected. We do a decongestive, or I'm sorry, a compression bandage. We use special materials that are safe for 24 hour use to help bring fluid out of the limb, bring it back to its normal shape and size. And we then fit with compression garments and then we teach self care so that people can manage that on their own after they're done with our treatment. So sometimes I've seen people and we have a, an image of a sleeve of, that people will wear and that really just keeps that down, keeps that swelling from happening? Yes, once you've gone through decongestive therapy and your limb is to the shape that it should be, that decreases your risk of infection and then that, that compression garment that we use, whatever it may be that's right for the person, would then contain that so that the swelling cannot come back into the limb. Okay. So is that something they need to wear all the time then? Not or? necessarily. Everybody is different. Okay. So we, it goes on a case-by-case -case basis, and it depends on what stage of lymphedema you're at. 
So you talked about um, manual lymph drainage and the massage that goes along with that. Mm -hmm. Is that something you teach patients then to do for themselves? There are components that we teach patients. I wouldn't teach them every component of it, but there are definitely components that are very helpful to help them manage that okay. condition. All right. If someone came to you preoperatively after they've been diagnosed but before they have surgery, what are some of the things that you would do at that sort of appointment? Well, we would review the diagnosis and we would review their plan for treatment to start off. Like I said, everybody is, has an individualized plan of care. And then I would educate them on lymphedema. I would educate them on prevention and things to look for and also take uh, measurements prior to surgery so that we have a really good thing to start with and know what we're comparing to down the line. And then I would also educate them on some community resources that are available to them and also some of the other things that they could be looking for after cancer treatment has occurred. So what are, what are some of those community resources, Tracy? Well, it's important to have a little bit of a lifestyle change often after a cancer diagnosis and treatment occurs. And so whatever those individual needs may be, whether it be a mental health practitioner, it might be a dietitian, it might be a personal trainer, a physical therapist, an occupational therapist such as myself, a speech therapist, it can be any number of things, Chris. Well, that's great that you can kind of quarterback them and, and uh, point them in the right direction. Absolutely. And create a plan that gives people hope. Um, you uh, talked a little bit about um, post-op treatment. What, what are some other things that might happen in post-op then? Well, depending upon, if we're talking about breast cancer, depending upon the surgical intervention and treatment that you've had, there are many different types of physical limitations that you might have. And so whether you've had reconstruction, you've had a lumpectomy, a double mastectomy, there are different um, levels of tissues that may be affected, and so we rehabilitate those differently. Okay. So we would need to you know, make sure that we know what might be removed or displaced in order to strengthen you appropriately. Now, can this be a male and female? Absolutely. Situation? Mm -hmm. Okay. So and it's not limited to just breast cancer either, but that is okay. a typical um, diagnosis. Okay. Uh, axillary web syndrome or cording. Tell me a little bit about that. This is something that can develop oftentimes after surgery, but not necessarily just with surgery. And I think the picture that you have is actually underneath of an arm. You can develop cording anywhere in the body, but it is a lymphatic embolism, which means that some of that lymph protein-rich fluid can harden in the vessels, mm. and it can become very painful, and it can limit range of motion. So we treat that with um, modalities such as heat and deep tissue massage and myofascial release, things like that to get, get control of the pain and increase function and mobility. So pain management, uh, mobility, what are some of the other things that you might help someone deal with? After a cancer, we have a lot of emotional, psychosocial burdens oftentimes. People need assistance with getting back to work or resuming occupations or roles in their life. Um, sometimes the physical limitations affect your activities of daily living, and so we would address that. And oftentimes people would need adaptive equipment Anything in line with lymphedema, care, management, or education, okay. effects of chemo, things like that. I know when I've heard you speak publicly, Tracy, you talk about energy levels in, mm -hmm. in post-cancer. Um, can you talk a little bit about that? Everybody is going to, to differ, like I said, but teaching energy conservation and sometimes just simply learning how to rework your day, rework your general strategies so that you can tackle the bigger tasks at times of the day where you have a little bit more energy mm -hmm. or gradually building that back up to a level that works for your life. And how can you involve family or caregivers in the treatment for, for patients? They're extremely important in, in the care of a patient and anybody that they have access to that's willing to help them is beneficial not only for their physical health, but their mental and emotional health as well. So we do any caregiver training and they can be involved in any part of care that the patient would like them to be. And what about diet? Tracy, is, is diet an issue in lymphedema? It can be an issue in lymphedema, um, and, and it can be an issue with any of the other components of cancer or cancer treatment. Mm -hmm. And so we look at that on an individual basis as well. And 
just make some suggestions or possibly get people set up with a dietitian if they need to completely rework that for themselves. Uh, exercise is important. And what about yoga as part of your treatment strategy? We also offer restorative yoga at our clinic and that is something that is designed not necessarily for an exercise purpose, but it's just like the word says, restorative. You're well taken care of for the entire session. We actually physically place your body in different positions that help to address problem areas for you. And it is complete relaxation. It teaches people how to purposefully relax and change a mindset. And that's got to be healing for, Very. for those that are involved. Very. Um, a little bit about radiation care, Tracy? With radiation, there are a lot of things that can occur. We see swelling sometimes. We can see scar tissue and adhesions forming and decreased circulation to the affected area. Now, radiation certainly serves its purpose in cancer care, but the after effects of radiation can be damaging and can also increase your risk for lymphedema. And so we manage the swelling, the adhesions in scar tissue and circulation with manual lymph drainage. Well, Tracy, it sounds like you are a vision of hope and restoration for your patients. Thank you. I certainly hope to be. Where can someone find you in the area? I treat at Coddington Physical Therapy, which is locating at, located at Coddington in West A. And also, I treat a couple of days a week at Crete Physical Therapy. Okay. So you're around and available. I am. And people should see you at diagnosis and then make a plan post-treatment. That, that was, would be ideal, but certainly even if you've had cancer treatment and a diagnosis 30 years ago, there are still possibilities for things that we can do for you. Well, that's great, Tracy. Thank you so much for your time here with us today. Thank you, Chris. And remember, it's never too late to live and learn. Can you sing, dance, do magic, or have another talent? Come show it off at Lincoln Seniors Got Talent. Aging Partners is hosting a talent show featuring local seniors in honor of Older Americans Month. For more information, contact Aging Partners at 402-441-6156 or email zolson at lincoln.ne.gov.